This ball is crushed. Hey everybody, and welcome back to Son of a Pitch, the baseball show by the fans, for the fans. We've got a lot of news this week, so let's dive right into it. Now, baseball's a sport with a lot of superstition and a lot of history. The Chicago Cubs have been a team since 1903, and where they play, Wrigley Field, has been a professional baseball stadium since 1914. But, fun fact for you, no Cubs player has ever thrown a perfect game since 1903, and no player ever has ever thrown a perfect game at Wrigley Field, like I said, since its creation in 1914. They came very, very, very close on Friday afternoon, the 20th, but it unfortunately just did not happen. Now, Cub pitcher Drew Smiley got to the eighth inning, was having a perfect game. He was playing the Los Angeles Dodgers, and the Cubs were up 13-0. David Peralta came up as a pinch hitter to lead off the eighth, and uh, he hit a slow dribble down the third baseline. Now, you would think, okay, routine play, first out, but Jan Gomez, catcher for the Cubs, collided with Drew Smiley, flipped over his back, and knocked him to the ground, leading the runner to be safe at first and causing Drew Smiley to lose his perfect game. That is about the most Chicago Cubs thing to happen in history, but you have to feel bad for Smiley because, well, those two records were a pretty impressive one to keep. Now for our next story, we're going to go back to 2021, when we have the Sticky Games scandal. Everyone was accusing pitchers of using a bunch of different things like spider tack, to make their hands and their gloves stickier. Now, the reason that pitchers want to make you know their gloves stickier is because it allows you to really dig into the ball and give it more spin. Increasing the spin of the ball allows you to get more movement, and obviously, it makes it harder for the batter to hit the ball. Phil Cousy, the umpire, suspended Max Scherzer for 10 games for using, quote, sticky stuff. Now, Cousy walked over and saw that Scherzer's hands seemed a bit sticky, so he demanded that Scherzer wash his glove and everything like that. And under the supervision of Kuzi, the umpire, Max did just that. He washed his hands, he put on hand sanitizer, ensuring that there was nothing on there. Then he took rosin and sweat, which is used by a lot of the MLB to, you know, get that amount of stickiness that isn't game breaking, but you know, it provides a slight competitive advantage. He wasn't breaking the rules at all while doing that. But Kuzi said that was too sticky and ejected Scherzer in the fourth inning. And why is this so problematic? There's a couple different reasons. First off, there's no standard established on what is too sticky. Scherzer's been using that same mixture in front of 95 other umpires. So why does Kuzi repeatedly call it out for not passing his own standard of stickiness? What's really, really problematic here is that Kuzi is applying a subjective measure to something that should be objective. Essentially, Max Scherzer is going to lose 6% of his salary this year and a permanent mark on his resume. And in baseball, a sport where people have unfortunately been banned from the Baseball Hall of Fame for many, many reasons, you have to wonder, how is this going to affect Scherzer's legacy in the long run? I am of the opinion that, you know, no one should be doing anything to give themselves an unfair competitive advantage. But I think Phil Cousy, unfortunately, took his power a little bit too far. And I'm really hoping that Rob Banfred and the MLB step in to ensure that there's a standard of stickiness and that no one gets unfairly punished, but also no one has an unfair advantage. When I started writing this news story last Monday, I was going to report on how the Oakland A's fans were having a reverse boycott. They were going to pack Oakland Stadium to the brim, or I'm sorry, Ring Central Stadium, as we learned two weeks ago, to the brim, full of fans, to uh, show that they weren't the problem. They didn't need to move to Vegas. They probably should have planned it for a little bit sooner than June, like they were going to, because uh, on Wednesday morning, we found out that the Oakland A's are going to become the Las Vegas A's, because they are moving after their uh, lease ends in 2024, they're moving on to Las Vegas, Nevada. The fans are absolutely crushed about this with Oakland releasing a statement, you know, essentially saying it's not you, it's me, by telling the fans that it wasn't them, it was that, you know, the stadium was going to be too expensive and too time-consuming and everything like that. Still, the Oakland A's fans got broken up with. It's pretty sad. We've been talking about them staying in Oakland, just like the Raiders did after they announced their move to Las Vegas, or playing in the ballpark of a Las Vegas AAA team. No matter what they end up doing, the real losers here are the Oakland fans. They've shown time and time again that they are loyal to this team, 
and unfortunately have really been screwed over here. Also, what is this going to change? Oakland for a long time has been the team with the smallest payroll in the MLB. And so you have to wonder, is this change going to encourage the owners to spend more money? Because if not, moving isn't going to increase Oakland's chance of making it to the postseason. In short, it's not the stadium, it's the players and front office that inhabit it. Now, another big part of the news has been the Texas Rangers' new City Connect uniforms. But unfortunately, I don't really know much about fashion. My qualifications are in baseball. So, I'm partnering up with somebody everybody loves, Newhouse adjunct professor Meg Craig, to talk all about the new Texas Rangers City Connect uniforms. Let's take a look. All right, so I'm here with Meg Craig, and Meg, you designed this beautiful baseball jersey, so I think you're qualified to talk about this. You also designed the shirt that you're wearing, but it's, you know, slightly different than this. Now, Twitter has been going kind of crazy over the Texas Rangers City Connect jerseys. So I want your honest reaction to the what I believe is a monstrosity that President George W. Bush has created. Are okay. you ready? I mean, you might have you might have turned me already since yeah, you think it's a monstrosity. I like to think I'm the great debater. Okay. We're going to start with, this is, this is maybe the best photo, and these are the players, and it's going to be on the screen, so these are the players in the jerseys. These are with no details being focused on. So what do you think of just that? Um... I mean, look, I expected a lot worse from the from the build up there. Oh, trust me, we're gonna get to the worst part in just a second. Okay, I think the uh, number font is a little weird. Uh, I'm gonna admit the number font's a little weird. The number font's a little weird. I don't know what's going on with that off-white eggshell color. I find it tacky. Oh, I think it's uh, antique looking. Well, it just looks like someone peed on them. Okay. Now, my pee is not this color. With with new uniforms come new mascots. Meg, do you like Panthers? I love Panthers. How do you feel about Eagles? Sure, I'm not a birds person. I prefer Panthers, but yeah. So what would you do if someone took a Panther and an Eagle and in the words of Nick Benjamin said wham and put them together to form the Peagle? The Peagle. The Peagle. Is this, this whole episode about pee and you just didn't tell me? No. No, but that's a great theme. Maybe that'll be week five. This is the Peagle which is the Texas Rangers' new mascot. Can we just, what is your reaction to the Peagle? Uh, it looks like one of those weird, ancient, uh, like, hieroglyph. It's like a sphinx, but, like, less cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yes, like a sphinx, but, you know, different. Yeah, this is supposed to unite the cities of Dallas and Fort Worth. They're supposed to bond over the Peagle. Because one of them was Panthers and one of them was yeah, Eagles? We're going to get to that. Great job. So this is the design breakdown. For the Texas Rangers, as you can see, we're celebrating Dallas and Fort Worth by putting together the Panther and the Eagle. They've got the weird gothic TX thing that I think is really stupid. I think that's a really crummy logo update. And then finally, we've got 421, which is San Jacinto Day, which is also the day that in the Mexican-American War, Texas was liberated. Okay, I do want to point out that the more I look at this jersey, the more I think that they're trying to make it look antique. They're trying for, like, Babe Ruth time baseball. Now, the logo, I'll give you, like, I don't like super complex logos. You've yeah. seen the OTN logo, right? Nice we're, and we're simple. on you. Yeah, it's, it's nice and basic. Sleek. Sleek. There's nothing sleek about this. It's not sleek. It's a lot. But a lot was kind of the way of things in... The olden Hockey. days, yeah. Baseball. I, I really, really think that's what they were going for here. Well, they may have been going for it, but in my opinion, they didn't nail it. I give this a 5 out of 10. Um, I think it just looks weird, and it looks gross on the field, personal opinion. I like vintage stuff. I'm going to give it a 6. And that's all from us. Now to our next segment. Next, Cody Ballinger likes to bring the smoke, especially on 420. You might be thinking, is this going to be a news story about Cody Bellinger being busted for weed? Thankfully, no. Instead, Cody Bellinger, on April 20th, 420, hit a 420-foot home run against the Los Angeles Dodgers. More than that, it was his fourth home run of the season and his 20th run. Finally, he was plus 420 odds to hit a home run. I don't know who's writing the script for the MLB this season, but obviously, they're drawing a little inspiration from Pineapple Express. A lot of amazing things about the Tampa Bay Rays this season. They started the season off with an iconic, historic run that is only rivaled by the 1987 Milwaukee Brewers and the 1982 Atlanta Braves for the longest undefeated season-opening win streak. They are undefeated at home, and last night, Randy Rosarina gave them another record, going deep in each of their first 21 games. That's right. 
21 games, 21 homers. More than that, a Rose Arena hit a walk-off homer in the 10th inning to ensure that that record stayed in place. Fans were worried after a Rose Arena went into the medical tent, but on Son of a Pitch, I have gained an exclusive picture of Rose Arena's x-rays, and I'm here to tell you everything is okay, because what did it reveal? A Rose Arena simply has that dog in him. With Oakland moving to Vegas, the MLB has finally checked off one of their big markets for expansion, but there are still some big markets that they can move into. There's a coalition to bring a team to Salt Lake City, Utah. But what about the other forgotten cities? Give me a team in Nashville that, you know, can share a stadium with Vanderbilt. How cool would that be? Or give me a team in Portland with a groovy Bigfoot mascot, something like that. When does Charlotte, North Carolina get a baseball team? They've had to languish under the mind-numbing mediocrity of the Panthers and the Hornets for years. Now, I know what you're all thinking, okay? Charlotte can't sustain another team because of how freaking cool Chubby, the polar bear mascot of the Charlotte Checkers, is. And that's probably true. If the MLB does place a team in Charlotte, North Carolina, then obviously they're all going to be playing second fiddle to the glorious magnificence of Chubby the Polar Bird. I mean, look look at this guy. The grace, the poise, the panache. We are all simply unworthy of Chubby the Polar Bear. So, future owners of the Charlotte, North Carolina MLB expansion team, please consider this a challenge. Design a mascot that is as lovable, huggable, and overall as adorable as Chubby the Polar Bear. Do that and your franchise will be an absolute success. Fail and not even a World Series will be able to redeem you in my eyes. Finally, I want to wrap up the news today by discussing the home run celebrations that MLB teams have been leaning into this season. First, you have the Pittsburgh Pirates, who are really leaning into that name with their home run cutlass, which Rookie of the Year candidate, Jiwon Bay, has been using over and over with these homers that he's been cracking all season. Next, channeling the spirit of Brian Robinson of the Washington Commanders, the Atlanta Braves also have a massive... Hat? Is it, is it? Yeah, okay. Massive hat. Simple, clean, oversized. I dig it. Shohei Otani is channeling his Japanese heritage with a $2,500 samurai helmet. One has to wonder, who's going to be taking it with them when Shohei inevitably leaves Los Angeles? Is it going to be a full custody thing, a joint custody agreement where Mike Trout can visit it on weekends? It's really sad to see a family torn apart, but maybe through this conscious uncoupling process, Shohei and Mike can rediscover who they are outside of each other. Julio Rodriguez is channeling the inner Jason Momoa that dwells inside of all of us with a replica Aquaman trident that unfortunately the Mariners haven't used much this year. Masataki Yoshida is paying homage to his Macho Man nickname with inflatable dumbbells. The San Diego Padres are taking post-homer Polaroids and bonus points for adding extra ambiance to the dugout. And someone on the Cincinnati Reds must have just played Assassin's Creed Valhalla because they are channeling their inner blood eagle with these Norse robes and helmet. The Brewers are paying respect to another team across the frozen tundra with their cheesehead celly. And finally, we have the Dong Bong. The Orioles started calling this the Hydration Station, or the Homer Hose, but the fans have spoken. This is the Dong Bong. Now, real quick disclaimer, please don't look up Dong Bong on Urban Dictionary. I know the contrarians in the audience are tempted to do so, but please, I have an eidetic memory. I cannot forget what I have read. Learn from my mistake. Do not Google Dong Bong. You will regret it. Now, normally, this is the part of the show where I give the standings. But since we're a month in, I decided to do something a little bit different. What would the playoffs look like if they started with a month into the season? The first round of the American League would have a bye for the Tampa Bay Rays, a bye for the Texas Rangers, the New York Yankees playing the Baltimore Orioles, and the Minnesota Twins playing the Toronto Blue Jays. That's right. Four teams from the AL East would all make it to the playoffs. Really sad for the Boston Red Sox, but I don't think this is surprising to anyone. Then, the first round of the NL would have a bye for both the Atlanta Braves and, woohoo, the Milwaukee Brewers. The New York Mets would play the Pittsburgh Pirates, and the Arizona Diamondbacks would be playing the Chicago Cubs. Now, we have a lot of season to go still, but this bracket does reflect the one thing that we all know. This first month of the 2023 MLB season has been unforgettable, unexpected, and pretty much a blast. Finally, to wrap up the show this week, we have to close with our traditional Sunday night baseball preview. This week, we have the New York Mets going to San Francisco, California to wrap up their series against the San Francisco Giants. The New York Mets won the first two games. The San Francisco Giants took yesterday's game, so it remains to be seen. Will the Mets win the series, or will they tie it up 2-2? Two and two? My personal prediction is that the New York Mets win this one, 
and we're going to get into why. Obviously, the New York Mets have Pete Alonso. He's tied for the number one home runs in the league. He's an absolute beast at crushing dingers. My personal prediction for this one is the New York Mets winning. They swept the Athletics, they won two of three games against the Dodgers, and are leading, like I said, 2-1 in the series in San Francisco. Then they have Monday off and head home to face Washington. One factor that could make this game especially interesting is the wind. They're supposed to be blowing through California at the time. It's definitely going to be a breezy game, and it remains to be seen how that's going to affect play performance. Another factor affecting this game is how fresh the bullpens have been. Since neither team have had to reuse their relievers too much, It'll be pretty unsurprising if the starters are pulled off the mound in favor of a fresh reliever. The Mets will be starting Tyler McGill, who's had a solid start to the season, lasting for about five or six innings per game, allowing no more than three runs each time with a 3.0 ERA. The Giants will be starting Ross Stripling, which is kind of unusual because he's mostly been a long reliever. So, all those factors considered, I believe the New York Mets will be winning this, getting their 15th win of the season, and charging ahead into the rest of the year. I'm Gabe Bradham, and this has been Son of a Pitch. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.